Hello. Hello. Um, who's that? We'll be, we'll be starting in just a moment for those of you who are entering. Okay, the no, I, I, I could. We're, my don't worry, is... Richard. We're about to start, Richard. So we're just waiting for a uh, critical mass of attendees. As they say on the television show, uh, this we are being streamed onto Facebook, so uh, we are being uh, some folks are watching it. Okay, well, let's let's make a start. So, um, thanks everyone for coming along and join us, joining us this evening, and a big welcome to this webinar hosted by CND as part of the Stop the Arms Fair Days of Action. It's entitled Selling Death, Why We Must Resist the Dicey Arms Fair. Defence and Security Equipment International Arms Fair takes place every two years in the London borough of Newham. It's one of the world's largest arms fairs and is heavily supported by the UK government's Ministry of Defence and Department for International Trade. It has over a thousand exhibitors who display weapons ranging from sniper weapons to tanks and promoting arms sales to countries with records of grave human rights abuses. It's also a major networking event for companies involved in the nuclear weapons industry. Arms companies are profiting from huge sums being spent on new nuclear weapons. and Many of these will be present at the fair. Indeed, there are so many reasons to be angry about this arms fair, to oppose it, and indeed to oppose the entire arms trade. And there's no better speaker, I think, to kick us off, um, particularly in that regard, um, than Kirsten Bays. Kirsten is local outreach coordinator for the campaign against arms trade and will give us a frontline report from the protests and explain why we oppose the fair. So, Kirsten, over to you, first of all. Big welcome. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. I'm just um, very aware that we are a little bit short of time, so what I'm going to do is just uh, set a little a little timer so that uh, we don't overrun. Um, and thank you for the welcome, Kate. So, yes, so over the last couple of weeks, uh, there has been... Uh, a series of protests outside the DSEI arms fair, both uh, uh, this week when the fair has been uh, running um, and has been attended by something like 30,000 arms dealers descending on uh, East London. Um, but also there's been uh, a, a, a series of days of protest aimed at trying to stop the setup of the fair. Um, the, the arms fair itself says it has 2,700 organisations uh, exhibiting at the fair. Um, I think looking at what, what they call organisations, some of them are subsidiaries and, and joint ventures of, of the major arms companies. So, you know, take that with a, a grain of salt. But we're talking several thousand um, uh, stands and, and, and all of the, the manpower and machinery that, that kind of goes with that. Um, and trying to, to stop that setup has seen different groups coming together to try and do it. Um, we've had people arrested on the faith day um, when Quakers, Anglicans, uh, Catholics, and, and people of, uh, uh, of all faiths and none uh, sort of came together um, to uh, block one of the gates. Um, and uh, again, saw a number of them arrested. Um, and similarly, on the climate day, uh, again, people uh, were sort of taking risks, trying to stop the stop the trucks getting to to the fair. And, and, and again, that that day saw arrests as well. So a different uh, a, a different different motivations, different mix of, of, of people trying to resist the setup of the fair. And also when the fair started on Tuesday to make it clear to all of the arriving arms dealers that they that they weren't welcome. So the question I, you might like to ask yourself is, well, why should why should you, why should each of us uh, oppose this arms fair? And I, I think there are probably five main reasons, and, and I'm going to also suggest a bonus one. Um, the first one is it is 
deeply tied to death and destruction in conflict. Um, you know, the principal people invited include uh, countries like Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Bahrain, Qatar, essentially the coalition that has been fighting the war in Yemen over eight years. Um, you might say, well, that, the, the, the war is, 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 is in abeyance for the moment. It, it's, still, it's still taking place and there's still no peace deal signed. And it, all we're really seeing at the moment is, is the factions rearming. So, you know, I, I think what we need to understand is that the arms deal taking place in dicey fuel conflict and, and Yemen is the classic example. Uh, where we've seen uh, tens of thousands of, pe of people uh, dying in in the conflict. The second thing, second reason to oppose it is uh, connected to what we were talking about yesterday outside Dicey, which is that um, conflict and climate catastrophe are generating huge numbers of refugees and migration, and arms dealers make a killing from those too. Uh, some of the large uh, arms companies, companies like Thales, Leonardo, BA Systems, make an a ton of money from surveillance systems, uh, security systems that sit on the borders, uh, watchkeeper drones, uh, uh, as well as having profited from the conflict that uh, that is driving the migration. So, conflict kills a lot of people. Arms dealers are making a killing from from the refugees that that, that are being created. But but there's more. Um, Global militarism, the amount of money that we spend on uh, militarism, uh, currently around 1.7 trillion, 1.8 trillion a year, uh, is a massive diversion of resources from the uh, things that we should be doing, uh, which is uh, spending money on, on uh, find, greening our economy and finding better ways to run our societies. Um, and what we, what we see is that um, uh, the military is responsible for something like 5.5% of global greenhouse gas emissions. It's as big as, uh, as, as a major European economy. Um, and that's within the figures that we can actually count, understanding that they don't necessarily keep track of, uh, keep good account of, uh, of, of, the, of, the, green, of the carbon emissions of, uh, of, of militarism. So it fuels conflict, it fuels refugee and migration, it fuels the climate crisis. It also leads to repression at home, uh, by which I mean militarized policing, the kind of policing that we see on our streets, increasingly violent policing, uh, increasingly um, adversarial policing using uh, riot equipment and, uh, 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 and, 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 and mass arrests and surveillance to kind of keep control of the population. You know, we've seen um, the UK uh, arms industry escorting, e escorting, exporting um, uh, uh, gas products to Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Hong Kong, Bahrain, uh, where, you know, this CS gas, I hesitate to call it tear gas, it's actually um, uh, poison gas is used to control crowds and is actually used to suppress the dissent that should be overthrowing those deadly uh, regimes. And the final thing to say is that DSCI is a manifestation of, of global capitalism. It's a way that um, the sale of weapons is a way that the system maintains itself. It, it's a way of, of driving profits and, and, and sums of money from the people that control societies, uh, from the people that are, if you like, the victims of, of war and uh, disasters to the people that control these societies. It's no... Um, uh, coincidence that Saudi Arabia is one of the biggest buyers of, of weaponry and also controls some of the biggest amounts of hydrocarbons. And hydrocarbon sales are used to purchase that weaponry and are used by the House of Saud to maintain its control over that. And by control, what it, what it means is that if should we try and, and put through green solutions for our economy, you'll find that they will take punitive action, both in cutting their arms purchases, but also increasing the price of fuel. The final thing to say, uh, and this is the bonus reason, um, especially talking to, to a CND audience, is that all of the nuclear industry are there. Um, when I was doing some research for this uh, talk this evening, I, I discovered that even though they weren't necessarily on the um, exhibitor list, uh, the Atomic Weapons Establishment have a stall at DSCI and have been playing host to the, uh, to the first Sea Lord, talking about their contribution to securing, as they see it, the... Uh, the borders and the, and the future of the United Kingdom. Heaven help us from 
that level of, of, of security. I think, you know, if, if there's nothing else we're thinking about uh, in terms of the, over the last few days, as, as we think, reflect on Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki, what we can really say is that nuclear weapons create no security at all. Uh, and the idea that they do is, is, is a massive delusion. And that delusion is being propagated at DSEI this week. So five reasons to, to oppose DSEI. Um, it promotes conflict and death. It, it means that uh, refugees and migrants are, are, are exploited. It, we, it fuels the climate crisis. It leads to militarized policing and massive oppression, both here and abroad. It preserves the structures of capitalism and driving resources to those who already have wealth. And more importantly, it perpetuates the lie that nuclear weapons create any kind of security. And so uh, if you get the chance, oppose DSCI. Thank you. That's really brilliant, Kirsten. Thank you so much. And also, can I take the opportunity to say what a fantastic organization CAT is and how much I'm sure we all really appreciate everything that you people do. So, you know, all power to you. Um, so, okay, so I'm going to turn to our next speaker now, Richard Norton Taylor. Uh, welcome, Richard. Great to have you with us as ever. Um, I'm sure many of you will know, but I'll just run through Richard's great credentials. He's a former Guardian Defence and Security Editor, and he's currently on the board of Declassified UK, which is the really brilliant investigative journalism website. And um, can I really commend that to everybody? If you don't already know about it, please do follow them or sign up for the, their free newsletter uh, because so much gets kind of blotted out of the mainstream media and through Declassified UK, we found out, find incredibly uh, useful and interesting and indeed deeply worrying things. And a particular highlight recently was the great work in exposing Britain's use or sending of depleted uranium to Ukraine. That was one of the really important stories broken by Declassified UK. So Richard, welcome and over to you. Okay, well, thanks very much indeed. Um, and thanks, Kirsten. I will obviously echo some of the points that she made because um, they are such fundamentally, in, in a sense, blindingly obvious points, I may say, um, not to, uh, to not to suggest uh, that uh, anything except that why aren't more and more people saying this um, every day of the week and every street corner, etc. Anyhow, um, I say there could hardly be a worse time for, I've just put together a few, um, a few um, uh, points here, uh, which I'll read from actually, if that's all right. Um, and I say um, any questions and of course uh, debates are important and wish there were more debates in the mainstream media, but um, uh, that's a consistent uh, source of Kate and others, of course, Kat and, and indeed me for many years, that uh, sometimes it feels that obvious points, you're, you're saying obvious points, but you're talking sometimes, it seems, against uh, a brick wall. Anyway, that, that, that could hardly be a worse time, I say, for promoting arms sales. Tens of thousands on both sides are being killed in the bloodiest conflict since the Second World War, a conflict that is destabilizing the whole of Europe and exacerbating a deepening economic and humanitarian crisis in what we now call the global south and Africa in particular. Um, the war of attrition in Ukraine, um, with seemingly relentless trench warfare, reminds me of the First World War and that great book, The Sleepwalkers, how Europe went to war in 1914 by the historian Christopher Clark after and, and, and after humiliating Russia, we never learn, or the West, uh, Western uh, leaders never learn, after humiliating Russia after the fall of the Soviet Union, encouraging rampant and corrupt capitalism there, Western countries expanded NATO and ignored Putin's growing appetite for revenge until that is last year's invasion of Ukraine. There's one group, of course, that is reaping profits from this appalling mis misery. Arms companies lick their lips at the prospect of mouth-watering profits and new markets after the failures and uh, which affected them a bit, um, the, the disasters of uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. 
and the share price of BAE, Britain's uh, biggest arms company, has soared and is expanding its interest in the US and is now setting up its own arms factory inside Ukraine. The British government cheerleads its, ro cheerleads its role as the biggest provider of arms to Ukraine after the US. It's an enthusiastic front runner in the race to be Europe's biggest spender on arms, despite Britain's chronic economic state and crumbling, literally crumbling, public services. It seems to think a country's status is determined, the British government seems to think, the country's st status is determined by the amount of weapons it produces, including the so-called nuclear deterrent, rather its probity, good governments, economic stability, and indeed the real influence, I argue, of soft power. One of the main arguments of both arms companies and trade unions in favor of manufacturing and exporting weapons, is that it is good for the UK economy and for jobs, highly skilled jobs. But those skills could be used, diverted for other purposes. Source into plowshares is much more than a cliche, it is an urgent need. Jobs could be kept for some years at least, even in the nuclear industry, instead of having to rely on French engineers and Chinese money at huge extra cost to British taxpayers, British workers and British companies could construct the civil nuclear power stations being built in Britain. Arms companies benefit from privileged treatment as health, education, welfare service and public transport struggle to survive. It's allowed to get away with extravagant and hugely wasteful weapons procurement contracts. A joint study by CIPRI, the Stockholm Peace Research Institute and CAT, a few years ago, concluded that arms companies benefit from taxpayers' subsidies to the tune of about 150 million a year. Yet arms sales account for just 0.04% of total revenue to the Treasury. Defense industrial sector accounts for just over 1% of British economic output and, and less than uh, and less or about 0.6% of total employment. Export markets make a mockery, as Kirsten has said, of officially stated government policy that it defends human rights around the world and does not export arms that would exacerbate regional tensions or be used in internal repression. Gulf states, including Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Bahrain and Qatar, notorious for their abuse of basic human rights, torture and executions are among the biggest markets for British arms. More than half of British weapons exports are sold to rep repressive regimes, Gatto recently pointed out. And successive governments have repeatedly succeeded in preventing backbench MPs from effective scrutiny of arms exports. Ministers misled Parliament over arming and training Saudi forces attacking Yemen in breach of international humanitarian law and have refused to give evidence to the Commons Committee charged with scrutinizing British arms exports. Exporting arms fuels internal repression and poverty in those importing those arms. The main causes of emigration that is increasing political pressure on European countries, including support for extreme right-wing groups. The arms trade feeds insecurity rather than diminishing it. There are more and more sources of conflict but beyond traditional quests for power and territory. As Kirsten pointed out, climate change, for one, for every one pound Britain spends on reducing carbon emissions, it spends 7.30 on the armed forces. On the armed forces, according to a recent study, increasing competition for increasingly scarce resources. Nearly 10 billion people will suffer water shortages by 2040, 2045. A little noticed study by the Ministry of Defence's own think tank, its development concepts and doctrine centre forecasts. As more is spent on arms, less is spent on aid, including to those countries who most need it. Countries deprived of equitable agricultural and industrial projects and appropriate technology, projects that could promote stability and reduce the, reduce the flow of immigrants risking their lives to seek, to seek a better life in Northern Europe. Meanwhile, extremist groups and militias and private companies in Africa are grabbing profits from the valuable resources, not only gold and oil, but also such Earth products as cobalt. Sorry. Hello. Carry on, carry on. There was a bit of background noise. Um, Elon Musk has shown how private companies can intervene in conflict by refusing a, a Ukraine request to activate his Starlink, commu Starlink communications satellite system to aid an attack on Russia's Black Sea fleet. 
This is the future of conflict, a, from, a, a future in which satellites, killer robots, killer robots, AI and cyber warfare take over from traditional weapons. It is a future where the most expensive British weapons, including the nuclear arsenal, are even more irrelevant, I argue, than they were already. HMS Queen Elizabeth and Prince of Wales, the two largest ships ever built for the Navy, the two aircraft carriers, will serve no purpose. Lord Richards, a former Chief of Defence Staff, once described the aircraft carriers to me. They are behemoths and unaffordable, vulnerable metal cans. There's a lot of talk about the decline of the West, of Western democracies in face of the rise of autocracies. Supplying arms to those countries won't help. Better to influence them and their younger populations by countering aggression and arms fears and promoting civil society, sustainable economic progress and soft power. And armed conflicts as military commanders repeatedly remind us invariably end in political and diplomatic settlements War in Ukraine is an unwinnable war. And one note, very quickly to end on. Soft power can include making a difference through all sorts of things, including art and activism. The art, the arms fair auction, in collaboration with demilitarized education, is now live and waiting for public participation at the Gallery 46, 46 Ashfield Street in Whitechapel. And there's an auction there closing uh, in a couple of days' time. I'm sorry if I mentioned that at the end. Um, any questions, please do ask me. Thanks very much indeed, Richard. And yes, this is just to remind everyone, um, please do put your questions in the Q&A box. And um, thanks for highlighting that art auction, Richard. I think that's really important to people have time, they've got um, the wherewithal to contribute to that, uh, please do so. And now we turn to our final speaker. That's the Mayor of Newham, Roxana Fias. Big welcome to you, Roxana. And I'd just like to start off by thanking you and thanking the council in Newham for your principal stand against the arms fair. You're an example to others around the country and internationally, and you provide hope to all those communities around the world that suffer as a result of this deadly trade. So we're really delighted to welcome you. Over to you. Thank you very much, Kate, and apologies in advance for some background noise. Um, and I've had both technical difficulties and transport delays which has meant I've had to jump off a train. And as you may be able to tell, I'm in the public realm, somewhere in the middle of London. But look, um, firstly, I wanted to uh, appreciate uh, and pay uh, deep uh, gratitude and thanks to the significant, important, vital work that CND here in the UK and globally do on this terrible, uh, worrying, disastrous, uh, existential threat, the nuclear weapons and the escalating global orientation towards war and conflict over peace and negotiation has and is having on so many communities in the world, particularly those that live in the global south. And as mentioned, Newham, it matters to us, uh, as many of uh, our guests uh, and members of CND UK uh, can attest uh, to the horror and the disgust that they must rightly feel. The Desai Arms Fair started this week, and it's a stone's throw away from the council's main office building in our historic Royal Docks, which is located in the south of the borough, an area where there are such stark inequalities. It's an anathema that you have uh, representing a global arms industry, representatives from the UK government and other sectors of this war fest descending in a venue that is located in Custom House, which has amongst the most uh, shocking elements of inequality. 
and poverty that uh, can be found anywhere in the UK. And in this past week so far, I've been speaking to many council officers who use the DLR line to get to our Royal Docks building in Custom House, who have said that they've been crammed in carriages with people clearly going to the Desai Arms Fair and they literally felt sick. And that's exactly how we feel as an administration and it's the reason why we passed uh, a series of policies at full council to say no to Desai Arms Fair, no to it being held in Newham, here in Custom House, and no to the global arms trade where the UK is positioned amongst six of the world's leading nations in selling 80% of the world's uh, weaponry for conflict, war and death. So I'm joining you in solidarity, I'm joining you in a equal sense of outrage that we are bearing witness to something that should be a historical artifact in a world ravaged by conflict, human suffering, and an array of humanitarian crises. We find ourselves confronted by an ominous presence in our own community, the Defence and Security Equipment International Arms Fair that is supported by the UK government. And today, tonight, I want to delve into some of the pressing issues uh, relating to the arms fair and why our opposition must remain steadfast. As mentioned, Newham is a borough that is shaped and characterised by stark inequality, but it's also a borough of a full, wonderful diversity of peoples from all over the world within our borders, conflicts around the world cease to be distant headlines, they become personal experiences for our residents because we have families and children who have fled the horrors of war and conflict who now call Newham their home. The presence of the arms fair in our borough is not just an event, it's a poignant reminder to our communities that have uh, experience uh, and who constantly worry about their loved ones trapped in conflict zones across the globe. Uh, there's also something that we've been elevating and amplifying since I became the mayor, the human rights and ethical concerns relating to the government's active support and involvement in the arms fair that takes place at the XL Exhibition Centre in Custom House, allocating billions of pounds in public funds to grant arms licenses to countries that, deplorable, that have deplorable human rights records. So it isn't just about economic transactions, it's a decision that perpetuates conflict and forces innocent people into a life of displacement and suffering as refugees. And as a consequence of that, whilst we stand absolutely as a borough of sanctuary, like many other boroughs in the UK, offering sol solace and hope to those in need, we're having to spend millions of pounds in order to support them, whilst the government, our national government, is enabling the death and destruction that causes them to flee their own homes and our commitment to humanitarian values is precisely why we vehemently oppose the arms fair year after year. And uh, those that have followed the Noom journey over the past decade since the arms fair was given license to also hold its repugnant event year in, year out over at the XL in the pursuit of profit, uh, let's uh, you know remind everyone We've been uh, advancing and advocating and in collaboration with the Mayor of London for Excel to cease this event and also for the government to cease the, this event happening here. And we are reminded about the astronomical costs of Trident, estimated some two point, well, £205 billion, pounds, which is a staggering sum of money when we're in the midst of one of the worst economic crises our communities, both in the UK and across the country, are facing. And that investment, that £205 billion that's been directed to Trident, notwithstanding the arguments that are being made around employment security, that it enables its horrific industry and a horrific sector that shouldn't be sustained. And that investment should be directed to the green economy that is our future and through that investment in the green economy as part of a just transition away from the arms trade and the arms sector that could create millions and millions of jobs as well as ensuring that we can direct that to 
105 billion pounds for more affordable homes and also strengthening frontline public services. And as mentioned in Newham, one of the reasons why we find it so abhorrent is because we've got this stark inequality and yet we have our own government that is enabling the global arms trade, which is valued at some 96 billion pounds billion pounds. So the armed trade for us isn't just a local issue, it has far-reaching global consequences. The trade in armaments has consistently been linked to global instability and conflict escalation. The arms fair at the DESI includes companies that manufacture a wide range of deadly weapons, from armoured vehicles and missiles to sniper rifles, tear gas and bullets, all instruments of war that cause death and devastation. These weapons, once sold, often find their way into conflict zones, exacerbating violence, prolonging suffering. And the environmental and ethical impact is also great. It has a huge toll. The production and use of weapons contributes to pollution and environmental degradation, undermining our efforts to combat climate change. So there are a range of ethical and environmental issues and challenges and dilemmas that face us as activists when we're challenging the government to stop this abhorrent uh, activity and event. So in conclusion, for us here in Newham, the arms fair represents a dark facet of our world, a world to, far too accustomed to conflict and suffering. And however, as uh, we have demonstrated, and whilst we've not been able to as yet stop the arms fair uh, happening again in Newham, we do hold the power to change uh, the narrative around global conflict and the role of the arms trade uh, in this terrible state of affairs. And we must be part of this burgeoning global community led by CND here in the UK and across the world to shift people's focus so that all of our collective priorities are away from profiting from death, but investing in life from away from arming nations to nurture and peace. And that's why I'm also proud to be part of the Mayor's Global Network for Peace. And as advocates for peace and justice all over the world, we are doing as much as we can and we must resist the arms fair here in the UK and elsewhere, not just for our sakes, but for the sake of future generations and humanity uh, overall. Thank you very much, Kate. Thanks very much indeed, Roxana. Um, apologies, I seem to have lost my screen, but hopefully it'll pop back up and hopefully you can hear me. So can someone give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Yeah, thanks very much. <laughs> okay, um, so um, thanks very much indeed, Roxana. That was fantastic. And again, deep thanks from all of us for the incredible support that you give to this, this struggle. Um, so I have a number of questions um, that have arrived. Two, two have vanished because, they, um, because I had to go out and come back in again. Because my screen froze, but I think I could pretty much remember them. Um, so I'm going to put a few out there to you panelists, um, and then so please do dip into whatever you want to. And then if we get another round of questions, um, let, we'll we'll take those. So the first one um, I think was triggered by something. Well, what Richard was saying about the war in Ukraine and the impact it has on Europe. There's an increasing militarization of Europe and something of a changing culture um, marked in, in some countries in particular, and an increasing glorification of war. Um, it's notable that um, in the forthcoming Labour Party conference, there's quite a, an increased role for arms companies there. And in fact, arms companies are sponsoring a number of fringe events. Is this part of this shifting culture towards militarization? And is this indeed infecting the Labour Party? That links to another question which was posed in the chat before my chat vanished, um, which was asking whether uh, Labour, if in power, would Labour also support the dicey arms fair? That's a couple of questions there. Um, 
there was a question asking you, Richard, to repeat one of the figures that you put there. So I like, uh, I like, yeah. you've got that, yeah. And then um, the final one in this round, which is um, our government seems uh, dead set on spending vast amounts on the military. It's like a bonanza for the military. They're heading towards 2.5% of GDP, which is taxpayers' money being spent on the military. Where does that 2.5% of taxpayers' money actually end up? So where does that money go? So um, feel free to comment on all or any of those things or related things, and then we'll come back um, to any further questions that appear in the Q&A. So please, audience, please do um, put your Q&A uh, there in the chat. So Kirsten, I'm coming to you first. Would you like to respond to any of those points? Uh, I, I thought it'd be interesting. The, the last question was was fairly interesting, which was talking about uh, uh, the, the, the funding going into, into the military. Um, Part of me was was about to say it it probably doesn't end end, end up anywhere uh it, it probably doesn't do as, as as much good as spending in almost any other area would uh, i think that's probably that's probably the nicest way of putting it um you can you can take 2.5 percent of gdp and spend it on healthcare. you could spend it on transport you could spend it on education and it would generate more jobs, more wealth, more human well-being than than any expenditure on uh, on, on the military. And I, I think, for me, that is uh, uh, I think that's a very clear um, message, and it's backed up by uh, by by a ton of research. So I think that that the idea that that now is the time to increase military spending when it's arguable that that we've we've seen the, the catastrophic failure of the militarized approach uh, of of maintaining. Uh, what they call security in, in, in Europe, I think, uh, I think, it, I think, it, it, I find it quite stunning. I, 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 the final thing I was going to say about military spending is that after the United States, if if you if you took the, the expenditure of the European Union when it was including Britain, the the total expenditure of, of that group was more than the rest of the world combined, uh, and and yet here we are again. They're still they're still wanting more money. Um, uh, I find it quite uh, quite shocking. Anyway, that, that that was my thought on on on, on that that question. Thanks very much indeed, Kirsten. Richard, over to you. Okay. Well, um, someone raised the question of uh, is it glorification of war of militarism and uh, the fact that Labour is in uh, enthusiastic about all this. Also, I think it's a question of uh, especially when it comes to Labour Party and Starmer front bench, that they're terrified of appearing to be, quote, weak on security. Now, uh, and uh, that means if, if, the, if the Conservatives say, ah, oh, they don't even want to produce arms um, and uh, defend Ukraine and this, that and the other. But the point is that, uh, as I said, they are, they are terrified of, 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 of being accused by the, the Tories of being weak on security and i use those phrases those words in the uh, inverted commas and um and, and my point, other general point is i'm, I'm talking about the, the, the principles of principled objections of course to the arms trade and so on but also those practical objections it's a complete and utter waste of money if you look at the um and admitted as such uh, by, by by some mps unfortunately they don't uh, persist with their objections the amount of money that the mod wastes on uh, conventional weapons uh, projects is extraordinary and uh, equally we know that the nuclear the nuclear deterrent is, is just not credible they, they have to rely they, they, the british government says it's independent operationally independent it's not independent because they have to rely entirely on uh, the americans not only for trident missiles themselves but on the know-how and the warhead um the new warheads, by the way, which are being manufactured uh, with difficulties. Everything is being delayed, and it's just no practical effect. And um, less and less practical, even if the height of the old Cold War, there might have been an argument possibly for Britain having nuclear weapons. But now, uh, these, 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 not only nuclear nuclear weapons, but also any conventional large weapon systems like uh, howitzers and, and aircraft carriers, 
um, are absolutely irrelevant in an age when more and more it's going to be AI uh, stuff, it's going to be uh, uh, dr drones, it's going to be cyber warfare. And, um, you know, for those practical reasons, the arms trade uh, is an utter waste of money, apart from the actual principled ones. Thanks very much. Um, and then Roxana, is Roxana still with us? Not sure. I think we may have lost Mayor Rias. I think she's. Um, okay. Okay. So while we're waiting for her to come back on, we hope, fingers crossed, um, I'm going to put to you two then. Thanks for fielding all these questions. Um, I'm going to put another round of questions to you. Um, firstly, uh, this is about, I think, about the MOD spending and their kind of overreach in spending. Uh, it was reported today that uh, one of the Vanguard, in other words, Trident uh, nuclear weapons submarines has just come back from its longest ever stint at sea. I think it was like half a year and they used to be out there for kind of 60 or 70 days. Is this a sign of um, kind of imperial overreach meets basically scraping the bottom of the money barrel and having too many ambitious plans? In other words, can they afford it? Um, so that's one thing that's about the kind of cost of, of Trident. Um, Secondly, um, we have someone asking, I'd saying, I don't think enough people know about the arms fair. How can you raise awareness? And then there's another one which is also linked to that, which is that last week, a YouGov opinion poll um, showed that 59% of the population were opposed to US nuclear weapons coming to Lake and Heath. Yet uh, there is no public or uh, parliamentary debate allowed about this. Um, how can uh, we make sure that public opinion is able to more effectively intervene in political scenarios like this? So, so related kind of question. And then uh, final question, can there be a world conference for peace? Okay, who would like to go first there? Kirsten, I see you at the ready. Thank you. <laughs> there, was, there was there were there were quite a few questions there. So I'm I'm uh, I if you like I, I can talk about the publicity uh, around the arms fair and I think that's uh, if you like that would be that would probably be a place to start and maybe uh, Richard could talk about uh, some of the vanguard stuff. I, sh uh, I should declare an interest site when I'm not working for CAT. I, I'm also the vice chair of the nuclear, nuclear information service. So I spend a fair amount of time geeking over Vanguard submarines and how terrible they are. But um, uh, I, I, I could I'd probably talk more about the arms fair. Um, I, I think the answer is we we do what we can as as campaigning at arms trade to, to to get information about uh, the DSCI arms fair into the press. And uh, there are some publications that are really good at, at, at getting information out and, and, and sharing it. Um, and we hugely appreciate that. And I think what I'd also say is there's, there's quite a lot of what you might call um, uh, underground and guerrilla type um, uh, advertising that's going on. I've seen advertising on the on the tube, and I think with, there's been sort of posters on bus stops and and and, and the classic sort of po uh, leafleting uh, from from activists is, is certainly certainly part of it. Um, but I, I guess what I would say is that the arms trade generally uh, likes to keep a low profile. Um, before we, uh, before this this round of the arms fairs, we took uh, something like forty activists on a, on a walking tour of the uh, some of the main arms company buildings in in central London. Um, it was called the Merchants of Death tour, but I, I I would call it a tour of some of the worst places the worst places to visit in central London, the the least good bits to go to. Um, although I, I should say very well appointed and very very attractive. Of course, the, it's the business that's going on inside that, that, that is what makes it terrible. Um, and the thing about it is, is just how nondescript these arms company buildings are. Um, you know, on several occasions, you know, the only indication that the arms company was there was like a, a little, a little tiny, little tiny gold plaque with the name of the company on it. And you, you pushed a buzz at it to get in. There wasn't a big sign outside. There wasn't, uh, uh, you know, there wasn't directions to say this way to 
L3 Harris or, or or Leonardo, you just you just stood there and you unless you knew, you wouldn't know you were outside an arms company building. And that's pretty much how the arms trade likes to operate. Um, you know, if you if you ride the train with uh, uh, the uh, exhibitors uh, and the and the participants in DSCI, they they take off they take their badges off. They'll never. You, 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 I was I rode a train out back from DSCI today, and none of the the, the participants in uh, DSCI were wearing their 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 event badges. They like to not let people know that's what they're doing. Um, and, and so yeah, so we. As, as as campaigners and activists need the help of, of the people on this webinar, the people on this call, um, to say, hey, this this is going on. Here are some facts. Share what you know. You you know, tell people about it. It's the only. It's all we can really ask for is 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 for individual word of mouth to say, hey, this event is going on in East London. I'm telling you about it. I know about it. I went to a webinar about it. And you, my my neighbour, my friend, my uh, colleague, should oppose it just like me. And that that's how we do it. Uh, that's how we overcome that kind of sort of wall of silence that the arms companies love to keep creating and love to keep profiting from. Thanks very much, Kirsten. And thanks for sounding so upbeat and positive about that. That's absolutely brilliant. Phil. quite inspired. <laughs> so Richard, over to you. I'm more upbeat than I am, I'm afraid, because I think with a couple of points related to these questions, one is that MPs uh, are frightened too. Um, maybe arms companies don't want to put their badges on, but they're tremendous at uh, seducing members of parliament by their hospitality and by arguments about jobs and, and the other and, and cliched about, you know, uh, defending Britain and national security and so on. And uh, they get pummeled me members of parliament and uh, you, you know, very, there's a handful, maybe one or two, uh, alas, one is about to leave parliament, uh, Caroline Lucas. Um, but the, um, it is a, uh, um, how does one fight fight this? This um, it, it is it's part of the deeply in, in, in kind of the deferential British culture, the British role, the British past role in the world, and all that our past history, uh, and gets sort of it becomes baggage really, and, and in the way of any kind of uh, uh, realistic uh, 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 analysis of Britain's role in the world today, and. Um, and on the point about, and, and, and indeed about publicity for, for the arms show, unfortunately, you know, non-violent direct action is the only thing that brings publicity, uh, apart from the odd story in the, the, it's, the odd few, few, few words in, in, in a news story here and there. Um, and it is very, very difficult to, to, to uh, apart from actually encouraging protests, which you know, is, is a good thing in a way, but it should be, it should not be the only way of bringing uh, attention to these things. And the point about the, the question about world, uh, world Conference of Peace, well, of course, the United Nations is meant to be. If you look at the Charter and everything, and, and I think Britain should have, well, it won't have, because the Security Council, but more and more members, and we should, and, uh, you know, CND and we all here, um, interested in disarmament in, in the broader sense, and, uh, and especially nuclear, but generally should actually get more of a grip and put pressure on the United Nations and encourage it, uh, many more uh, coalitions of maybe smaller countries who haven't got pretensions to be sort of warrior nations, uh, which after all are the majority of the United Nations. I don't know why they can't get together and push themselves. They haven't got the confidence again to they rely on money from the, these uh, countries with, um, with, with large uh, uh, military expenditure. Um, it, I mean, there won't there won't be a world conference of peace if they do. If people are going to say it's going to be a, 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 a abuse, and not many people are going to turn up. Not many countries are going to turn up. United Nations should be the forum, and um, Britain, alas, is weakening the the, the UN uh, rather than strengthening. Anyway, thanks, Richard. And I've got um, this, this might be our final question, but um, maybe not. Um, so this actually relates to what you were saying just then about the UN, Richard, and the kind of different values that exist elsewhere in the world. Uh, and it's a question about the um, increasing, the rise of the global south, um, relating to uh, recent news that the BRICS economies, that's largely the countries of the global south, um, are have for the first time surpassed the economies of the um, of, of the 
G7, that's that's it, can't read that, um, of the G7. Um, is, it, is this a significant shift in what's going on in the world and the balance of forces in the world? And if so, is it likely that um, the impact of a rising global south will be an impact for peace? And this is taking into account that um, the overwhelming majority, if not all of the global south, is already self-organized into nuclear weapons-free zones, and indeed it is the countries of the global south that led the development of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. So, I mean, I think that's, that's a, a great question, actually, because it's so obvious that the leadership role of the global south, and also, in fact, in terms of calling for um, peace talks, ceasefire negotiation around Ukraine and so on, that the role of the global south appears to be different to that played largely by the global north. So uh, is there a possibility, Kirsten and Richard, of a significant shift in global values as the global south um, comes to the fore more? Uh, maybe I can, I can start to have a go Kirsten, at that. Kirsten, I see you're unmuted there. Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I was about to say maybe I could have a go at that. I was also going to. Uh, I also realised we hadn't answered the question about the um, uh, the the record breaking patrol. Um, I was going to say I, I think there was a real connection between that record breaking uh, nuclear fleet patrol and uh, the fact that uh, HMS Vanguard, uh, the the, the, uh, the signature ship of of, of that class of, of submarine. Uh, its repairs should have lasted four years, and I think it it it, it got out after six or seven years yeah, of, seven. of repairs. So, so I think there's a real connection between one one ship being out there for way too long, and the other one being in repair in the shop for uh, much longer than anticipated. And partly because, uh, again, because some of the, the stuff we were talking about is 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 the country is, uh, is 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 working beyond its means in terms of its uh, uh, it, it, its defense spending. Um, going back to the the, the, the BRIC countries, I, I think the challenge you had uh, to, to to suggest that that creates a, a potential new way of, of of the world being is is that uh, Russia and China are both large uh, arms exporters, and they're both uh, significant players in in, uh, in 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 the export of of weaponry, um, and and so. You know, if anything, uh, they are looking to kind of increase the amount of business that they do overseas, noting that uh, Russia finds itself uh, uh, somewhat on the back foot uh, in terms of some of its uh, some of its weapon systems. But, you know, it, I, again, you know, from their from their political leadership, they're, they're very much uh, in favor of, of arms, arms, arms selling. And India, uh, as one of the BRIC countries, is is one of the biggest arms buyers in in, in the world. It's one of the the, the, the real target countries for, for arms sellers. Not a big buyer of UK weaponry, but certainly in the case of uh, buying weapons, especially from uh, you know uh, the other other European countries and and indeed from 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 Israel as well. So, I would love to believe that uh, uh, a, a shift in the balance of of power from the from the north to the global south will lead to to a reduction of militarism. And it will if we are, are acting in solidarity with the many peace campaigners in Russia, in China, uh, and in India who take tremendous risks to, to push for, for, for peace in their countries. So um, even though the current governments perhaps are, uh, are not hopeful, we, we can at least um, support the efforts of, uh, of, of, of peace campaigners in those countries and encourage them to change their policies. So that, that would be where I would where I would come from. Uh, Richard, hopefully, will have, Richard will have a uh, perhaps a, a different view, but I think that's... that's no, no, yeah. Can I just say this very quickly? Um, everyone talks about the global south. Now, the, the BRIC countries, well, including, as you say, Russia and China, um, want to uh, influence the, quote, global south. They attack the, the market. They want to try and get the, the global south on their side. Uh, Putin says, uh, and China, of course, to uh, attack the West. The West is much, far too much on the defensive, in my view. Um, Western democratic countries against autocracies have said that. Um, Putin uh, today talks about the sacred uh, war against or sacred uh, hostility or whatever he calls, he used the word sacred, against the West. Now, the point is, if, um, if you want to get the, the, the one way of getting global south on, on your side, and the, let's talk in and and, and the contradiction really. And this has got to be part of the the arms, the um, 
to producers, the autocracies. I mean, I don't want to get too much on, on the binary thing here, but um, if if surely it would not be difficult to tell to encourage the global south. To, to be on the side of those people who are not selling them weapons all the time. And, and the, as we know from the Chinese belt and, uh, and whatever it's called now, it's now sort of gone to uh, falling apart, actually. Uh, the Chinese tried to um, invest in, in uh, or, 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 or lend money to Sri Lanka and other countries in Africa, that then uh, land them in debt. So I think the Chinese ambitions in uh, Africa, and I think the Russians will uh, not be very popular soon afterwards with the... Uh, uh, as well in, uh, in Africa and so on with the militias and Wagner group, et cetera, et cetera. But my point is that um, to get the Global South governments who are suffering, who are, um, uh, and, and including with the Ukraine war, get, getting more and more poor, whose governments uh, uh, maybe want arms, but allowing um, uh, Chinese and other companies uh, to uh, mine their uh, and and steal really their rare earths cobalt and congo etc etc i mean it can't it can't be beyond the beyond the wit of man and people and opposition people if there are in 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 china and, and russia and so on but more likely in the west generally and in brazil and so on to actually encourage i'm saying going to say tell but just actually point out to the global south that they're, they're better off with a system which is um which uh, which said helps them, and that is not buying arms and being in, 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 under the uh, uh, increasingly under the um, under the inf influence by by uh, uh, China and Russia, who um, um, would increasingly put them in debt, and they uh, are, are arbitrary. They they don't uh, discuss these people. They seduce in very uh, crude ways. Some African countries and the dictators in those countries. Now it'll take some time, but I mean, there's a sort of logic between encouraging the global south and the poverty there um, that their interests lie not in uh, anyone selling arms to them. That's whether it's the BRIC people or whether it's uh, China or Russia or whether it's uh, Britain or US and anywhere else for that matter. I mean, that's that's the that's the that's the sort of vague hope I have that. That how to get the global south on the side and other people too, of course, of of us sensible people, and and, and disarmers. That's that's my point, really. Okay. Well, thank you both very much for those very interesting discussions. I think what I'm taking out of that is the importance of international solidarity with the peace movement across borders. That's absolutely fundamental and basically down with all arms trade. <laughs> I'm sure we're all absolutely agreed on that. And I think that's uh, neatly taken us to the end of our time. Can I appoint you in the direction, everybody, of the information there in the chat from Sarah? Um, we have a, a day of action against US nukes coming back to Britain. That's on the 23rd of September. Um, you can see a link there. And also, if you want to do something local, please do get in touch with Sarah at that email there. And also, a big thank you to Sarah for doing the technical side and organising us this evening. And a huge uh, thank you to our three speakers, Roxana, who had to leave uh, a bit early for another meeting and to Kirsten and to Richard. We really appreciate your support. And that was a really fascinating discussion. And um, thank you to you, the audience. Really, um, really delighted. And we'll send round a link to the recording of the uh, webinar. So thanks a lot, everybody. And um, keep on struggling. Thank you. And winning, of course. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good to see you, Kirsten. Take care.